Good afternoon, Saints. In in this video, I'm going to be looking at a uh, track here by the uh, Seventh Day Adventists, and it's called "Signs of the Times: Global Trial." You're involved, and it's put out by the uh, the uh, Glow Tracks. That's the uh, tracks that the Seventh Day Adventists put out, and uh, they're pretty common. Um, I know Seventh-day Adventists uh, like to use these. They like to hand them out. And uh, we're going to be looking at this one. And this track right here will be proof that the Seventh-day Adventists do, pre do preach um, work salvation. And uh, I've heard often that um, from other believers that they do preach work salvation. And it is true. And uh, I've seen also videos of um, SDAs that claim that they don't preach work salvation. But this track is uh, pretty much, you know, says a lot of what gospel they preach. And it's not the gospel of the Bible. It's a works gospel that cannot save. And I'm just going to read it and we're going to check it out and check out the scriptures. So this is... It's going to be a track to prove from their own publications, their own tracks, that they're putting out a false gospel that can't save. And in fact, they're sending people to hell. So we're going to see this track. And, I, you know, I, I don't have anything against the Seventh-day Adventists. Nothing personal against them. Um, I just do think they're wrong in a lot of uh, areas. They do have a lot of false teachings. Such as soul sleep, the investigative judgment, annihilationism, work salvation. And we're going to read this verse. So this part right here is called Facing Judgment. Human courts, seldom, human courts seldom discover the whole truth. Judges and juries listen to the evidence and try to find the facts as, they best, as best they can. But imagine a judgment in which everything comes out in the open. A judgment that lays bare every action, every motive, even every thought. That's the kind of judgment the Bible says that each of us will face when life is over. Here's what God's word says. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. Romans 14, 10 and 12. The Bible adds, it is appointed for men to die once, but after this judgment... It's clear then that everyone, saints and sinners, will appear before God in the great judgment day. If that thought makes you fearful or uneasy, read on. See, right off the bat, they had just assumed that everyone, that God's just going to have this final judgment day where he's going to clump all believers, saints and sinners together and just judge them all. That's not how that works. God has two separate judgments. There is a judgment seat of Christ, which is specifically for believers, and it has nothing to do with salvation, but it has to do with rewards on what the, what the Christian did here on earth, based on a Christian service to God. And the other judgment, the Bible describes it as a great white throne judgment. That's a judgment uh, for unbelievers. They're going to be judged for their works, and they're going to be cast into a lake of fire for all eternity. But here it seems like they want to just clump all people, saints and sinners together, and there's just some final judgment day. In fact, that's a false eschatology, and it's uh, it's not separating the two judgments. And it says, continue, the, what the Bible says about the judgment. The Bible is clear that we will all, that we will all face God's judgment, great judgment day. Well, you know, there's two judgment days. There's the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat of judgment, and then there's the great white throne judgment. One for believer, one for the unbeliever. And what a day that will be. The Bible describes it. I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it and whose face the earth and heaven fled away. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. 
That's in fact referring to the unbeliever. The unbeliever is at the great white throne judgment. And this takes place after the millennium. This judgment will probe the very depths of each person's heart. No, it's not each person's heart. It's a judgment specifically for the unbeliever. The unbeliever is going to be judged at the great white throne judgment. And it's going to be a guarantee that he's going to be cast into a lake of fire. Because once the person is at their great white throne judgment, you're not going to be able to escape it. Because you're there, then God is going to cast that unbeliever, the wicked, into hellfire for all eternity. Sorry, it's not hellfire, it's uh, the lake of fire for all eternity. Continue, it says, Jesus said, I say to you that for every idle word men speak, may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. Matthew twelve thirty six. The Bible says that God has appointed a day on which he will judge the world. Acts 17.31 And we know that day is fast approaching. Soon God will open the books and judge each person's life record. That's actually the books are going to be open at the great white throne judgment. You don't see any books open in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 15. I'm just going to read that really quick. See, they just assume that some book's going to be open for for some sort of judgment or for including for believers. But that doesn't the Bible doesn't teach that. The the books are open on the great on on the uh great white throne judgment and it's in judgment for the unbeliever. The, so in 1 Corinthians uh chapter 3 from 10 to 15, I'm going to read. It says, According to the grace of God which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon, thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Now every man there is not referring to literally um, saints and sinners, unbelievers. It's referring to believers here, because Paul is writing this, and he's writing this to uh, believers. It, verse 14, it says, If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. A reward. So a reward is something that we get for serving uh, God here on earth. It's a reward. So this judgment has to do with the reward. We're going to be judged as believers upon our works. And we're going to receive a reward for that. If we serve God here on earth, if we build uh, gold, silver, and precious stones, we're going to receive a reward. But if we uh, build wood, hay, and stubble, we're going to see what happens in verse 15. Uh, verse 15 says, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So if a believer builds uh, wood, hay, stubble, his works are going to be burned. It says he shall suffer loss. What is he losing? Not salvation. He's losing rewards. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Even though that believer has all his works burned, a believer comes... To the judgment seat of Christ with no works to show forth, he's going to be saved. And it says, yet so as by fire, even by hellfire. So we see there that judgment has to do with believers. That's and If you've noticed, there was nothing mentioned about some books being opened and where God opens the books and then he has a record of all their bad stuff they did, of, of believers that they did, and then you know they're it's just put on them on the day of judgment because that would be that's actually completely false because the books are open on the great white throne judgment for the unbeliever and he's judged. The reason those books are open is because they're judged um, of their works. So all their works they did are recorded in books and they're open and they're going to be cast into a lake of fire. No record, no, there's no record of sin for the believer because the believer's sins are 
um, no more remember. They're done. And it says, the Bible says that God has appointed a day. Oh, I already read that. Um, in fact, the Bible is clear that the judgment has already begun in heaven. Now, this ties in with their uh, their doctrine of the investigative judgment, which is unbiblical. And for the sake of this video, I'm not going to go into that. I'm just going to read from this uh, little track here. It says, Revelation pictures an angel calling out, Fear, worship God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. Revelation 14.7 When Jesus comes to earth again, he will bring his reward with him. See Revelation 22.12 Okay, let's go to that. Revelation 22.12 So, Revelation 20 to 12, it says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. So, that has to do with the reward. Jesus Christ says, He comes quickly, and when He comes, it says, My reward is with me. So, He's ready to give, Jesus Christ is ready to give reward to give every man according as his work shall be. Now, that's not referring to the unbeliever. Nor is that referring to salvation because we know salvation is not a reward, it's a gift. That's a reward referring to the un or sorry, the believer. He's gonna give a reward to the believer. And it says the saved will be given eternal life, and the wicked will be destroyed. Now if you notice it says the wicked will be destroyed. That just ties in with their uh, false uh, belief of the uh, annihilationism. See, they just assume that the unbeliever is going to be destroyed, yet the Bible doesn't teach that it's going to be destroyed. The unbeliever is going to be uh, cast into uh, the lake of fire for all eternity. If that is so, then obviously a decision, a judgment, must already have taken place place before Jesus comes to determine who is saved and who is lost. This investigative quote-unquote phase of God's great judgment is going on now in heaven in preparation for Jesus' soon return to earth. And that's actually false. There's no investigative judgment going on. Again, that's just tying in with their false belief of the investigative judgment. Um, there's no judgment going on or no, no quote-unquote investigative phase going on in heaven where Jesus Christ is keeping tabs and records of all believers who've been saved and keeping track of their sins. Oh, well, well, you know, so-and-so is not really doing what he's supposed to do, so I'm just going to keep track of their sins. And then on Judgment Day, on the Judgment Seat of Great, the, ju the Great uh, Day of the Judgment Seat of Christ, I'm just going to, you know, open the books and I'm just going to judge them and then eventually cast them into hellfire. That's not how that works. God is not having some phase right now where he's investigative uh he's investigative the sins of believers that was already taken care of on the cross in fact Jesus said in John 19:30 it is finished what was finished his payment for all sins so once you believe on Christ it's done there's no investigative phase in fact I'm going to turn to uh Romans uh chapter Four. I'm just going to I'm going to read first uh Romans 3 verse 22 it says even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. So the righteousness of God is placed, imputed, unto the believer by when he, when that person places their faith on Christ, then God's righteousness is imputed to that person's account. 
And that's why it says, Unto all and upon all them that believe. <laughs> For there is no difference. And Romans uh, chapter 4 says, I'm going to read up to verse 6, says, What shall we say then? What Abraham our father hath found, our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath worth to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man, unto whom God imputed righteousness without works. Saying, so I'm just going to read this verse, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. I'm going to read up to verse 8. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. There you have it, folks. When you believe on Christ, your sins are forgiven. And your and God imputes. In fact, Paul says that he's he's talking about David. As when David it says David also described the blessing of the man unto whom God imputed righteousness without works. So this was not only just something that was for David, it's for all people now. It's for everybody in all dispensations. Those who believed on God. God, um, he imputed his righteousness over to, to uh, that person's account. In fact, we even see this in the first few verses. We see how Abraham believed in God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And in fact, even Paul says that blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Our sins are not covered. That's an Old Testament thing. We Our sins are um, forgiven. They're they're erased. They're done. That's why he says, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So once you place your faith in Christ, he says that the Lord will not impute sin anymore. What are Seventh-day Adventists saying here? He's, they're saying that there's some sort of investigative phase of God's great judgment is going on now in heaven in preparation for Jesus soon return to earth. This investigative phase is false. And it's actually a heretical teaching. The Bible does not teach this investigative judgment. That's just in line with Seventh-day Adventist uh, doctrine. There's no investigative phase going on for a believer. Because God said he's not going to impute sin. So who's right here? The Seventh-day Adventist church? Or is God? Well, we know that God's word is right. And we know that this investigative judgment doctrine is false. And it says, continue, why a judgment is necessary, but isn't God a loving Heavenly Father? Why does the Bible paint such a scary picture of Judgment Day? With God himself examining each person's life in excruciating detail. Why doesn't God just forgive everyone and let us all into heaven? In order to understand the need for a judgment, we have to understand that God is just as well as loving. It's difficult Sometimes for us to recognize that justice and love are two sides of the same coin. If my son is beating up my daughter, I'm not a loving father unless I do something to stop it. And that may involve administering justice to my son. It's the same with God. You see, someone has been beating up on God's children. The Bible calls Satan a roaring lion going around seeking to devour us. 1 Peter 5.8 He rebelled against us. He, sorry, he rebelled against God in heaven and he tries to tempt each of us to join him in his fight against God. In love, God has to meet Satan's challenge. But doing so means that he must destroy sin and all those who insist on clinging to it. And that means looking into each person's heart. In other words, looking. In other words, God has to make a decision, a judgment about each, per, each person. He loves every one of his children. He doesn't want anyone... To, to be lost, Second Peter three nine, but in justice as well as God as love, God must finally separate persistent sinners from those who love and serve Him. That's why judgment is necessary. See this? It says, but in justice as well as love, God must finally separate persistent sinners, as if Christians are not going to be sinning. 
You don't have to be afraid of God's judgment. All this talk of judgment sounds scary, doesn't it? It's frightening to think about a judgment that examines every thought, every motive, every act we've ever done. We know that our lives haven't been perfect. What chance do we have of coming through such a judgment without being condemned? In fact, right here we see even that they do preach works because it says God must finally separate persistent sinners from those who love and serve him. So this is based on works. See, they think that a, sin, a believer is not going to be committing sin and being persistent sinners. Well, they clearly have not read the epistles to the Corinthians because the Corinthians were living carnally, Paul says, and they were still saved. I'm going to continue here. Here is a comforting fact. Jesus himself is your judge in the judgment. See John 5.22. The one who will be your judge is the same Jesus who loved you enough to die on the cross for you. The same Jesus who told the woman caught in adultery, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And then here we go. We have the, uh, according to their, this is their false gospel. How to be prepared for the judgment. Repent of your sins and confess them to God. Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Acts 3.19, the first step is to recognize our sins and repent. Be sorry for them and turn away from them. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Okay, they just added a bunch of conditions to salvation. First of all, there's no scripture that says repent of your sins to be saved. There's no Nowhere is uh, repenting of sins a condition upon salvation. The only condition for salvation is faith. That's Ephesians 2.89, Romans 6.23, Romans chapter 4, 1 through 6. Uh, then you have also Romans 3, 24 to 26, Acts 16, 31, and then you have Romans uh, 1, 16. And there's been plenty of other verses that show that salvation is simply by faith. And it says, and confess them to God. You don't confess anything to God. God never tells us to confess sins. The confession of sins has to do with the believer. Repent, therefore, and... Okay. And it says the first step is to recognize our sins. That's correct. And repent. That's correct. But if you notice their repentance, they see, they think repentance means being sorry for your sins and then turning away from them. No, that's not repentance. Biblical repentance is, in the context of salvation, is turning... From unbelief to belief in Christ. That's uh, repentance in the context of salvation. Never are you told to be sorry for them and turning away from them. That's work salvation. And then they add 1 John 1 9, which is a scripture that has to do with believers only. A believer can only confess his sins, and it has to do with fellowship. We confess our sins. When we're out of fellowship with God, we're supposed to confess them so we can get back into fellowship with God. Otherwise, we're out of fellowship. So they added many conditions already. They added repent of sins. You have to confess. You have to be sorry for them. And you have to t turn away from them. That's four conditions. When God never says to do any of those, He just simply said to believe. In the number two, it says, Believe on Jesus Christ and accept Him as your Savior from sin. That's correct, but the first part isn't. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth, believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.16, and then Acts 16.31, 2 Corinthians 5.19. Number three, Let us work in you to live in harmony with His will. Sorry, let Jesus work in you to live in harmony with His will. We may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he, Jesus, is, so are we in this world. 1 John 4.17 By this we know that we know him, Jesus, if we keep his commandments. 1 John 2.3 That's not referring to salvation. The proof that you have truly accepted the saving grace of Jesus is your willingness to let him change your life to reflect his character. Jesus himself said, If you love me, keep my commandments. 
that verse has nothing to do with salvation. That has to do with progressive sanctification. That since the believer has now trusted in Christ, he should be keeping the commandments of Christ, keeping the commandments of God, because he should be doing that as a believer. Once you're saved, you should be walking with God. You should be now in your progressive sanctification, because there's three tenses to salvation. There's you're saved from the penalty of sin, saved from the power of sin, that's progressive sanctification, and that can only be done when we surrender, yield to the Holy Ghost, and then there's final salvation, which is we'll be saved from the presence of sin, and we'll have our glorified bodies in heaven. But they add this verse as if you have to do that to be saved, and that's completely false, and it's a misapplication of the scripture. It has to do with uh, progressive sanctification. Number four says, trust Jesus. That's correct. He says, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. The Apostle Paul puts it in this way. There, there, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And then they end it with, God loves you. It's true that as a sinner, you deserve the sentence of death and the judgment. But Jesus has already died in your place. He has taken your sentence upon himself and paid the penalty for your sins. If you accept what he has done for you and in faith claim him as your savior, if you will let him live in you and reflect his character in your life, you can face a judgment without fear. Everything was correct up until the hyphen. They said you just have to, it said you have to, uh, he has taken your sins upon himself and paid the penalty. If you accept him, what he has done for you, and faith claim him as your savior, see that's already correct. You just believe what he has done for you, and, you, and then you claim him as your savior by faith. That's correct. But then they said, if you will let him live in you and reflect his character in your life, see now they added another word. You have to reflect the character of Jesus Christ. If you're not really reflecting the character of Jesus Christ, then you're not going to be saved. They added so many conditions. Now you, This is the gospel that Seventh-day Adventists preach. And this is proof that they do preach a works gospel. Despite what they say, that they want to claim that they don't really preach a faith alone. They preach a false gospel of works. And this track is proof of it. It's titled, Signs of the Times, Global Trial, You're Involved. And this is put out, as we said, by the GLOW the Glow Publications, Glow Online. This is a track by them. And this is proof that they preach a false gospel. This gospel track can't save anybody. They had to repent of his sins as a condition. You have to confess. And then you have to be sorry for them. And then you also have to follow Jesus Christ. Because they say you have to let him, you have to reflect the character of Jesus Christ. And you have to keep the commandments according to the way they use John fourteen fifteen. Well, if that's the case, then no one's going to be saved. And this, in fact, is a satanic gospel, and Paul warns that those who preach another gospel, let him be a curse. This is not the gospel of the Bible. This is a works gospel that can't save anyone, because the gospel is by faith alone. You can only access God's grace by faith. That's Romans 5, 2. Salvation is quite simple. You simply acknowledge that you're a sinner, that you're headed for hell, and then you trust, or sorry, you believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and then you trust in Him as your Savior. That is the biblical gospel of grace, of the grace of God. So this gospel track is uh, can't save anyone because there's a false gospel printed on the back. By the this is put out by the Seventh Day Adventists. So if you encounter Seventh Day Adventist tracks like this, um, I would just throw them in the trash because they can't save anybody. So this is it, folks. This is the gospel that Seventh Seventh Day Adventists uh, preach, put out by their uh, their publications. So thank you and God bless you.